The following is a presentation of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. You've always got time for short time. Hey, it's Mario Lopez. David Taylor. Fred Metcalf. Johnny Hendricks. Tony Ramos. Bubba J. Mike Gold. Matthew Modine. The one and only Chael Sonnen. And you are listening to the one and only Short Time Wrestling Podcast by the often imitated and never duplicated Jason Bryant. So here we are, episode 345 of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast. My name is Jason Bryant, and if you have been listening for quite a long time, going back to November of 2013, thank you for listening, thank you for subscribing, thank you for your support. If this is one of your first times listening and you picked up shows from the Junior Nationals in Fargo, North Dakota, we've had a little bit of a different theme these last couple of days because we've been talking about one of the biggest tournaments in the world and one of the most important for American wrestling at the high school and international level. That being said, this tournament also has a special meaning to me in my professional career as uh, as I was cutting my teeth as a teenager, snagging phones, and in some cases, uh, cooking chicken. I'll get to that in a moment. The relationships built over the years in Fargo, North Dakota at the USA Wrestling Cadet and Junior Nationals have been crucial to my personal development and my career development, as well as maybe perhaps my growing waistline, which is, is it's not so growing anymore, but This year marked the 19th consecutive year that I have spent at least some part of my July inside the Fargo Dome and in the dorms at North Dakota State University. There is this; these are one of the things that when you're looking at your schedule, I have built it around. Okay, we can't get married there, and we got a plan. Okay, we can't have kids in that window. Like Fargo is on my calendar. This is this is a no brainer. Although things change as you get older. And for me, at 37 years old, a married father of two girls, five years old and one years old, I don't think I even said that grammatically correct, things can sometimes come up. Last year, I had a child just, well, actually, my wife actually had the, did the actual physical part of having the child. Uh, Ruby Rio came into this world on July the 8th, 2016, about a week before junior nationals, so I opted still to go. I did have to cut one day off of my journey, which was the first time I had ever missed a day of competition since 1999. This year, my wife, who is a just rock star professional at her company, had the opportunity to go on a business trip to Puerto Rico for a week. Well, it was also happening at the same time I was to cover, and I use that word loosely now since I don't do as much coverage coverage as I used to when I was with uh, with Intermat and the first iteration of Matt Talk Online, which was at the time from 1999 to 2004, a Virginia website. But uh, So my responsibilities have, have changed over the years, and I've, I've worked for myself at this event. I've worked for Amateur Wrestling News, the Open Mat USA Wrestling, the NWCA. I joke that I've had more jobs in wrestling than Wade Chalice, not quite up to Sammy Henson level yet. So this tournament, Abby, my wife, has a chance to go to Puerto Rico, and I'm the, usually the one who does the traveling. She's the one who has the, the dynamite career, career with the, uh, the master's degree, and you know, generally she's probably smarter than me in, in 99% of the things. I have her on wrestling and useless trivia. Uh, that's probably about the extent of it. So the, I'm not going to say, no, you can't go, because we got two, two kids at home. So she goes, I make the sacrifice to cut my Fargo in half this year. It's the first time. In my night, in 19 years of covering this tournament, that I have had to leave early and miss more than one one event. Last year, I felt bad that I missed the Cadet Girls. This year, I got a chance to see the Cadet Girls and both of the Junior and Cadet Freestyle Championships. I missed Greco and the Junior Women and the Women's Duel. So I don't feel great about that in terms of, look, I'm not trying to say I, I happened to leave because Freestyle was first. No, I was going to leave on the Tuesday night regardless if it was all Greco or if it was all freestyle. I was content to sit there, and I've watched this tournament from home for the first time. So all those things being said, there's also a couple things that are factoring into this year. I'm in the middle of this wrestling show today, and it started as a contest with like 15 people in it, and now it's just me and Joe Caprino from Indiana Matt, and he's cheating, and he's he's not using the hashtag, and he's doing everything he can and still whining about not singing I'm trying to disqualify him. One, he doesn't know how to spell day, D-A-Y, and two, he's actually hosting tournaments and having them various different shirts made so he can win this contest. I'm calling shenanigans. Now, actually, Joe is uh, Joe does a great thing for, this, for the state of, of Indiana 
Indiana with Indiana Matt. And uh, he's got a lot of shirts to say Indiana Matt, uh, Carroll High School, which where he where he coaches, and the Indiana Hoosier Preseason Open, which is a tournament he runs, which is uh, one of those big qualifiers for the Super 32. So known Joe a long time. I like to give him some crap because, uh, well, I, I can. And he, he will give it right back. So I'm on day, as we record this, day 100. And just by sheer chance, I picked up the Nebraska Omaha shirt, as Mike Denny refers to it as the other place. So this was a shirt that Coach Denny gave to me. Uh, when I covered, I don't even know what year. I think it was at the Brutaditas Nationals in 2006, would sound about right. And it, you know, Coach Denny's just a first class guy. Even though I don't want to honor UNO, but I want to honor Mike Denny. So this isn't about UNO. This is about Mike Denny. So wrestling shirt hashtag wrestling shirt a day. Now, as I say that, Fargo is also a place where I've acquired gear over the years. And why do I have so many shirts? Fargo is a big reason why. It started back when I started helping out Team Virginia. I got the gear package. Then one year, uh, Van Plokus was the state chairman from uh, from Pennsylvania and asked me to send some results from Pennsylvania back to Bruce Clausen, who runs WrestlingReport.com. I did so. They presented me with a jacket and a T-shirt and some and you know a little little cash for my trouble. Then I started making my way through the world of Intermat from 2005 to 2008. And I started having a, a reputation in the sport of wrestling and being somewhat of a known entity. And with that, I had become friends with a lot of people at the Bison Turf and Buffalo Wild Wings and various other haunts around Fargo. And they would like, hey, here's a shirt. Here's a shirt. Here's a shirt. Here's a hat. Here's a jacket. Here's a shirt. So over the years, I've acquired, I mean, literally hundreds of wrestling shirts. And, and some of them have seen their way to goodwills and some of them have, have been uh, gifted or traded. And it's not like, I don't want to keep your gift. It's just uh, sometimes a team 2000, uh, a 2005 team Pennsylvania shirt really isn't going to make its way into my regular wardrobe. So sorry about that van. Now this year, I want to thank some people because this, I had a really good gear haul <laughs> this year and this isn't a humble brag or anything, but in, I was only there for four days. So the amount of gear wasn't the most, but I'd say it was also the h- highest of quality. I'm also not a beggar. I'm on. I'm not like Willie Sater at Flow Wrestling who's sitting there on Twitter going, "Hey, if I don't get a shirt from every state, blah blah blah." Uh, actually, I think Willie did do something like that a couple years ago, and I think he actually got like 45 pieces of flair that year. I think I was at like 32. I wasn't asking, but I was just merely sitting next to Willie, uh, where my media perch used to be, and uh, we both accumulated quite a bit. This year, I did pretty good. I actually, I think the final tally is I got 24 shirts, two quarter zips a hoodie, two backpacks, and a pair of shorts, and at least one hat. I actually just got a hat in the mail today from Brockport. So technically that wasn't in Fargo, but uh, it could count in the hall. And people I want to thank on this because you can can take pictures and and do all sorts of things and – and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I can do that, but I'm gonna. You're gonna see a lot of these on wrestling shirt today because now I have 26 more items to extend my my competitive advantage against Joe Caprino. But uh, uh, Jeff Lathrop from JRWrestling.com and Team Minnesota, he came up with. Uh, he he came over to the table. He I'm not gonna say he came up with the idea, but he uh, he came up by producing the shirts and gave me and Richard Immel one for the Game of Throws. Minnesota's here. It's a it's a play on Game of Thrones, which I've never actually seen an episode. Brandon Bradley, my buddy from Virginia, and he's the head coach at Nebraska Wesleyan, the sweet sweatshirt. Gene Lee of Illinois with probably the sweetest package I've ever received from a team. It's a backpack. It was a bunch of shirts. Uh, there was some shorts in there. Uh, that, that stuff was made by Blue Chip and Jason Heslop and the crew there. They do a great job. My hats came in from uh, Cliff Fretwell, a sponsor of this program and, and a gear sponsor. And for all you patrons, that's where you get your stuff. It's from what I get from Compound Clothing down in Jordan at cmpteamwear.com. Cliff Fretwell hooked me up with these hats, That one of which I'm wearing right now. Omar Padilla of Oak Park, Brett Haas from Dubuque Hempstead, uh, Grant Turner from Athlete Performance Solutions, a.k.a. Nike Wrestling, of course. Caleb Schaefer from the University of Providence was actually wearing a hat, and Taylor Miller from USA Wrestling was looking at me going, is that all it takes? I go, hey, Caleb, that's a good-looking hat. He took it off his head and handed it to me. And granted, the colors at, at University of Great Falls, which is now known as the University of Providence, are changing, so you can call that vintage. Nathan Coburn from VAWA uh, also got to thank Herd and Horns and B-Dubs for supplying me food and beverage. Uh, Andrew Nicola, Concordia University of Nebraska. Uh, Jeff Upson and Eric Knopsider from PA Power and PA Power Wrestling there have a show here on the Mad Talk Podcast Network. We're coming up with a slick PA Power gear of all people, Rick Rock, Rick Rockwell. Now, this guy has him and I have gone probably toe to toe 
on message boards and even DMs and Facebook messages since I was like at Intermat. So we have like a a 12, let's see at this point, yeah, a 12 year like love hate relationship. And it's just funny because we can we can scream at each other on the internet and then like see each other at like uh at, you know at a restaurant and be like, "Hey, Ray Rock, what's up, man?" And uh, he hooked it up with a really slick looking Riverside Wrestling. He's a coach out there in Oregon. Uh, just so many people, Austin Bernard for taking the team photo for Team Virginia. Uh, really hooking it up from TechFall.com. And while we're on the, the subject of TechFall.com, John Sachs uh, looks like he suffered somewhat of a, a heart attack at Nationals. I'm sitting at the table. He comes up to me and Richard, talking to Richard because he's shooting photos for USA Wrestling. And he says, uh, I'm feeling horrible. I'm having some intense chest pain. I'm going to go back to the dorm. Well, I uh, checked it out, and uh, John's going to end up having to get surgery. Uh, did get cleared to fly back to California. But, John Sachs, you are in our thoughts. You are in our prayers, bud, because uh, you have been – one of the one of just the good people in the sport of wrestling, and you do it. You know he's a photographer by trade, but he's a photographer by love of the sport of wrestling. So John Sachs at TechFall dot com. Thank you for all that you do. We're here with you, buddy. And uh, want to kind of get into what this episode is about. Is after I've spent about ten minutes of thanks. And it's about memories. And in the last episode, one of the previous episodes of this particular program, I talked that I was going to have a bonus points episode with Richard Immel uh, about some of my best Fargo memories. Well, we never got to it. Instead, Richard did something that was really good. He's got these bonus bites episodes that are out there from USA Wrestling and the Bonus Points Podcast. If you get the Matt Talk Podcast Network shows sent to your your Pod feeder, podcast, podcatcher, whatever you want to call it, of choice, you'll know that there, there's 11 interviews out there right now throughout the course of the week. I've put out a couple here on short time, but the idea was to tell the story about some of the best memories I've had from Fargo in 19 years, and most of that has been archived on the internet in some way, shape, or form. Uh, I'm going to go through just some of the stories that I have and memories now that they could be, rob- I mean, I can probably go on this for, for hours, but I'm going to try to keep this uh, short, sweet, and to the point as much as a guy like me who likes to talk can be short, sweet, and to the point. I'll start in 1999. I am living in Pocosin, Virginia between the semesters. I think it was my, let's see, 99 into 2000 would have been my third year. Yeah, third year in college. Uh, I'm 19 years old. I graduated at 17, so I was about, to, I was turning 20 that summer. And I was working at a KFC. Yeah, I was working at KFC with my buddy Sean Buckley, one of my high school friends. And we would uh, cook chicken during the day and play disc golf after we got off work. And just generally kind of a, a little bit of a rowdy summer for, for me. I was doing the Matt Talk online thing. And the previous year, I had met Mike Newburn, who was a coach with Virginia. He was also the state director of the Virginia AAU at the time. And they had the Junior Olympics at Oscar Smith High School in 1998. And that's where I met Mike. And, uh, you know, he, he, he calls me up and this is the day before Far- the Fargo team, Virginia is supposed to leave. And he's actually on the Virginia USA wrestling staff at the time too. And he goes Dwight Gary Alcon couldn't make it. You want to go to Fargo? And Gary Alcon is a referee. So, and this is also pre nine 11. I was like, sure. I call KFC. I was like, dude, there's a big national tournament. My, I was my manager's name was Rod. Um, not really that nice of a guy. And, uh, he says, there's a big national championship tournament. I've got an opportunity to go. I can't be here from here to here. And it's like, okay, whatever. Uh, That's where things change. And for the record, I was Gary Alcon on the plane. And on the way back, my name was Jason Cox, who actually was ended up being a wrestler at VMI. He was a a cadet at at the time from Amherst County High School. And I actually, uh, I remember getting back on the plane in uh, Minneapolis. We had bussed from Minneapolis. You know, we landed and then bussed there. And it's funny because that's now I know that road very well. And uh, he said, Mr. Cox, OK, we'll just need an ID. And I just looked at him and I went, I'm not 16. <laughs> and he bought it because I even had a go- goatee. And it's like, OK, can't do that nowadays. But uh, all that all that changed everything. Satan Reed Johnson Hall at North Dakota State. And when I say it changed everything, it really did set the course of, you know, my life in a different manner because I, I showed up pretty much unannounced. Rob Sherrill had to vouch for me as a media entity because he had he had him and I had met when I was in high school and he was covering the Virginia duels with uh, the Illinois Best Weekly and the Prep Wrestling Coast to Coast and he did the rankings for USA Today uh, team rankings at the time and and Rob vouched for me it's the first time I met Gary Abbott who would uh, soon be my boss and and for a short time I, I had the opportunity to crash with him and his wife when I first uh, lived in Colorado at USA Wrestling and 
well, I'll get to that. But that, that really started the 19-year friendship with Gary so far. Uh, that year, Christian Smith made the finals of Cadet Freestyle 83 and a half, and he ended up being a three-time state champ, wrestled at the NCAA championships for Duke and a Liberty and for Liberty. There was no Buffalo Wild Wings at the time, but there was a bison turf. And there I bought a mug. And, of course, if you remember what I said earlier, how old I was, well, I was in college, too, so you can probably assume that there was some some form of identification that was may or may not have been me. So uh, anyway, I may or may not also have also been from Alabama, depending on which particular ID I was using or, or my name might have been Kevin. Anyway, Turf Mug was born. Bought that. Still take that back every year. It's actually kind of taken on a persona of its own. I shared a dial-up line with Sarah Koenig from ncmat.com, and you might know her as a previous guest on this show as one of the tournament directors for the Super 32. As I said, Rob Rob vouched for me, and uh, we were splitting a phone line. I, I really don't remember much about the competition because I was really new to the national scene. The guys I followed were from the Dream Team Classic that was held in Virginia that year. Uh, so guys like Foley Dow, Jason Powell, Clark Forward, uh, those were the guys I really had national exposure to. Uh, two of those guys on that Team USA a dream team that came into Lake Taylor High School and just laid the wood to Team Virginia, 49-3, to uh, were Damian Hahn and Jason Potter. Hahn from New Jersey and Potter was from Illinois. And uh, they met in the finals of Fargo. So that was kind of kind of a big deal. Uh, and, and, and coincidentally, this past week, I ran into Jason Powell, who was the only guy to lose during that bout. And he lost to my high school teammate, Mike Akers, who ended up wrestling at Virginia Tech for a short time. And I happened to be wearing a Pocosin, Pocosin wrestling shirt that night. So I actually sent a picture, a selfie of me and Powell, two acres. And <laughs> he thought it was thought it was pretty wild. So year two is 2000. The Buffalo Wild Wings is open. Therefore, uh, yeah, things were happening. Taco Bell reopened. It was actually closed for renovations. And this was also my introduction, really, to who uh, to Justin Lester was. But at the time, they were calling him Harry. And he was in Junior Greco. He wrestled Mark Jane in the finals at 132. And Mark Jane was a returning Greco champ. And Lester won cadets a year before. And it was just like the most just excruciatingly quick. F- boom, three, boom, five, boom, three. And then another throw for good measure. Uh, yeah, Harry Lester was a bad mamma jamma that year. Uh, Virginia had two cadet champions. Christian Staler won at, I believe it was uh, 103 or 103 and a half, whatever the weights were back then. Uh, Albert Big Country Childress. From Grundy was uh, another cadet champion at 242 pounds. He ended up being a four-time heavyweight champ for the Golden Wave. A kid named Sa- Tyler Safratowicz from Minnesota won at 83 and a half pounds. I remember because he did the backflip, and then he was an All-American years later at 165 pounds from Minnesota. I also saw Mary Kelly wrestle for the first time. She went two and two in cadet freestyle, and one of those wins was against a Virgi- or one of those losses was against a Virginia kid named Micah Amrozowitz, who is the assistant coach at the Newport News Apprentice School. He had to come from behind to beat her eight seven, and it was like, oh wow. Uh, Two thousand one, I started doing work with the mat dot com, writing freelance features to help pay my way out there, and it, it's like I had this, just the anomaly group. I wrote a story on Ma- Mary wrestling against the juniors. Uh, there was a kid from New Mexico who had cerebral palsy. And I will always remember this kid. His, I mean, he was a kid then. I mean, we're talking at this point 16 years ago. He's, he's, he was into computers back then. Uh, he has cerebral palsy. His name was J.C. McMaster. And I remember him asking, I said, hey, what's a link or an email? I can send you a link to this story. And he was like, okay, it's pimp <laughs> underscore limpin. And I'm like, okay, you know what? You said that. I couldn't say that. I mean, the kid was just just great. Jeff Courtney from West Virginia. He was an All-American. He's deaf. So uh, that was that was another intriguing story. Also had a set of triplets from Indiana. They were the Dibberns. It was like a law firm. Dibbern, Dibbern, and Dibbern. Uh, I think they ended up wrestling a junior college at Muskegon at some point. Also, Travis freaking Lee, folks, comes out and stops Nick Simmons from j- becoming just the second guy to win four junior freestyle titles. Only other guy to do it, Alan Freed. So Travis Lee comes in, and I even played this pun in the headline, Lays, like L-E-I, like Lay, like you know, Hawaii, uh, lays the Greco gold on to Fargo. Yeah, that was the Travis Lee breakout session, folks. The next year was also different because I decided to drive. So this was my fourth year, and I had a Bronco with like two, a Bronco 2, like a baby Bronco, like an 89 Ford Bronco 2. This thing was a piece of trash. Broke down like 14 times, but I have the great idea that I'm going to drive to Fargo. 
So I'm going to map this thing out, and I'm going to see baseball games. That's that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Cleveland, then Chicago, then Milwaukee, then Minnesota, then drive to Fargo. Or actually, I was going to hang in Rochester with my buddy Charlie, who's actually now here in Minnesota as a St. Paul cop again. He was actually wrestling on the team at Old Dominion down there at the time. But I uh, got a day late start, so Cleveland's out. Then I'm driving down Addison into Chicago. It's going to be a Sunday night game. It was supposed to be, I think, the Cubs and the Marlins, and uh, people are pouring out of the stadium. Well, guess they guess what? ESPN moved the game, so I missed out. So my first Major League Baseball game ever is a just nondescript Reds-Brewers game a week after the All-Star game, and that was the year the All-Star game was a tie. So I actually remember signing up for a credit card that I was declined for uh, to get the free hat. You know, my in college, you know, it's like Chris Rock said in that movie, uh, Head of State. My credit is so bad, they won't take my cash. But, yeah, so I drove out there. So uh, I think Chris Reitzman was on the mound for, for, for the Reds. That's really all I remember. And uh, a father-daughter doing a cross-country trip. This, this girl was probably close to my age, was wearing a Jason Kendall jersey and just talking about baseball so much. So much, so much. So the next day, that night, actually, I leave. And before that, I did the brewery tour at Miller beforehand because I'm actually of age at this time. And I discovered Lining and Kugels. So that's another another, another story about what, why I pick certain beers when I used to come out here. Now I live out here, and I don't need to pick those things because I can get them anytime. So uh, get in the car after the Brewers-Reds game, drive as far as I could without falling asleep. I got to Eau Claire, and I stayed at like a $39 XL Inn right off the highway. Yeah. I need to talk to Tim Fader and about finding a better place to go to have o- o- you know an, an image of Eau Claire in my head. Next day, drive in right into the game, the Metrodome. I'm an Angels fan. The the Twins are playing the Angels. Eric Milton versus Jared Washburn. This was a preview of the ALCS. It was stoked. Uh, other things that were about that trip is I did karaoke at a TGI Fridays in Brookfield, Wisconsin, and met a guy who is the who was at the time the Roy Orbison karaoke legend. Uh, he actually had a shirt that said that. I was in my phase of singing uh, offensive songs like Chocolate Salty Balls and uh, Clarence Carter's Strokin'. If you're not familiar with the tunes, you can probably use your imagination. Uh, also, it was the first year of the junior women as we talk about wrestling, and I, I've alluded to Mary Kelly twice already. This is really the moment when I, I realized that women's wrestling was like a thing because Melinda Ripley, who I'd never heard of from California, came out and, and Mary had wrestled against the guys and she was like a cadet world teamer. And it's like, she was like the, the big name in women's wrestling at the time developmentally. And uh, yeah, she lost in the finals. And that was like, who the hell is Melinda Ripley? Yeah. Somebody was pretty good. Uh, Natasha Umamoto was third at that weight and she got the first pin of the tournament. I remember actually taking a picture of that specifically for that reason. Mike Poeta beat Brent Metcalf in cadet freestyle and it was the only finals loss in, in Metcalf's career. I, I think I remember that Poeta hit him on exposures with stepovers. Now, I'm not quite clear on that. I just I think that that was uh, that might have been the case. Uh, decent year from Virginia. Anthony Burke, who is from my club, he actually graduated high school with my sister, uh, was fifth in a bracket that had Coleman Scott, Mike Rowe, Garrett Scott, Joey Slate, Mike Rodriguez, Jake Kriegbaum, and Eric Albright in there. Uh, yeah, that was good. Patrick Bond from Virginia won Cadet Freestyle. Some guy from Nebraska named Todd Manili beat the unbeatable Tion Ware. And some guy with an afro won Junior Freestyle, 171 pounds. Here he's pretty good at disc golf. Another key about that year, the Vans Warp Tour was outside. It, the Vans Warp Tour, yeah, outside. Crazy. Year five, I drove again on short notice. I was supposed to drive out with a photographer named Paul Swisher. Couldn't get a hold of him. He was apparently in the hospital, had like a blood infection, like couldn't answer his phone. So I just woke up one day. I was like, all right, I can't go. It was like a, it was like a Thursday. I'm like, all right, I'm gassing up, going to Jiffy Lube, getting an oil change. I didn't stop until I got to Milwaukee, which uh, when traveling with a 2000 in, in 2003 at the time with a 1988 Atlas, I, I went an hour and a half out of the way because that, that run from Chicago through Rockford to pick up the, the interstate in Madison wasn't on the map. Yeah, so no wonder that trip took you know ninety minutes longer than it should have. Uh, other things, I went to that that night that stop. I stopped at Motel Six, same at that same karaoke bar again. The Roy Orbison guy, believe it or not, was there again. Uh, it was an All Southern Cadet final. Nick Marable of Tennessee beat Ben Fiaco of Georgia in the finals, and I slept through the first Cormier Morrison wrestle off as a result of uh, what may or may not have been a house party at a North Dakota State uh, sports team that's known for Pom Pom's House. Yeah, I'm going to leave that one alone. Year six, rode the bus with Team Virginia and wrote a blog on Matt Talk Online, the old version, and won the Connect Four Championship. And this was a point where Matt Small, who was then the coach, assistant coach at Great Bridge and, and a college buddy of mine at the time, 
you know, he's got the Ric Flair autobiography and he goes, woo. And then he says, hey, Twink, I got Connect Four. So I built a bracket using Kreider PC tournament software and made a bracket for the bus. And this was like a 64 man bracket. So we had, it was probably 35, 36 guys, coaches, kids, trainers, whatever, uh, to which I won the tournament. And I was actually making, uh, you know, snide remarks the whole way. Uh, that year, also, Henry Cejudo beat some guy named Spencer Mango in the Greco finals and was up 9 nothing or something like that and then threw uh, Mango on his head and thought he got 5. And so, yeah, X, it's over. Mango, nope, it was only ended up being 9 instead of the 11. So uh, Mango come back and bombed him for 3. And I think that should have been a 5, but it was only scored 3. Ended up being 13-3. Cejudo won that one. 2005, we move on, year 7. I was just hired at Intermat. I did not actually live in Pennsylvania yet. Um, I, I remember I stayed at the Econo Lodge or, or the Best Western because it was near Bucks, the borrowed roadhouse, the, the the redneck country bar, or that I thought was a country bar, and it's more like an alt country bar. Florida had a crazy year, and I remember getting into an argument with Rob Sherrill about who Franklin Gomez counted for. And it was like Florida or Puerto Rico. And I say Puerto Rico because that's who he was representing. And Rob's like, he's from Florida. Uh, other things that I, I remember about that is Robbie Smith from California, who you know is Fear the Beard. Uh, he beat Cody Gardner in freestyle, which really did kind of stun us. Justin Wren uh, from Bishop Lynch in Texas won in Greco. You might know him as now as the, as the big pygmy. Uh, but, and when Luke Ashmore won a cadet title, all those guys, including Wren, jumped over the railing, much to Sandy Stevens' behest. And then uh, as they tried to climb back out, you heard Sandy just shrieking. But Wren was a heavyweight and couldn't quite leap over it and ended up getting like into an argument with the security guard. Uh, got thrown out. A couple of Wyoming kids met in the Greco finals, but at the time, one of them had moved to Ohio. Uh, the guy who won that match was named Tyler Cox, who ended up being an All-American at Wyoming. And the other one, uh, the Wyoming kid who had moved to Ohio, was a guy named David Taylor. Taylor went on to win freestyle at, at 91 pounds, because I remember saying, hey, watch this. Year six, you know, excuse me, year eight in 2006, the first year of the garbage rules. And this was a horrible nightmare in terms of, of traveling. Uh, snowstorm, I mean, snowstorm. Yeah. Might be fitting for North Dakota rainstorm got, got hit me in O'Hare early in the morning. And I ended up trying to get on a flight out of Northwest airlines into, uh, into Minneapolis or into Fargo that night. So I'm the next one to get in line. Jim Shear is actually ahead of me at the time. And then I'm the next one to get on the plane with the last seat. And all of a sudden unaccompanied minor comes running through and they get right on the plane. Yeah. Connor McDonald from Delaware stole my seat then he won the tournament little shit anyway ODU had two signees in the fi Fargo finals and I say that in jest uh not the ODU thing but the the McDonald thing we actually still joke about that today uh ODU had two signees in the finals which was kind of big James Nicholson was at 119 he wrestled uh, Zach Sanders and Adam Kobala at 130 uh, he, he wrestled Kellen Russell uh, Eric Gohalas actually is still this is a story I still tell about Eric is I'm interviewing Eric after he beat Dante Butler in the Greco finals and Butler like cut right through us and Butler was like second in Fargo like five times a Missouri kid scrappy is scrappy as all get out and Butler cut through us and goes man you ain't you ain't whatever and I <laughs> just looks at him and goes dude I just fived you uh, it was one of the one of the more crazy responses I've ever I've ever been a part of in my career uh, continuing on, Eli and Michaela Hutchinson of of Alaska became the first brother sister combo to win junior titles the same year. Uh, in two thousand seven, year nine, these Oregon folks were talking about this kid, or uh, Norman Richmond, who uh, who never really did a whole lot on the national scene because he didn't go. But uh, he split finals with Jason Chamberlain. He beat him in Greco, lost him in freestyle, and Helen Marulis wins a chicken. Yes. Helen won her first junior national title. I'm next to Nicole Woody, who wins the junior national title, who's also from Maryland. They're going nuts. I can't I, – I, yeah, they, uh, they're they jumping around each other, and it's crazy. Uh, Hayden Zilmer and Jade Rouser were at the same weight also that year at 84 pounds. Zilmer was a double champion at 84. Uh, coincidentally, both college All-Americans, Zilmer at 184 pounds – while Jade Rouser was a 133-pound All-American in 2016. Uh, there was this group from Pennsylvania that was nasty, led by the Alton Brothers and Josh Kindig. Uh, then moving on to 2008. Last, my last year at Intermat, I had to convince Pat Tossi to let me drive. I would just pay for gas uh, and not request mileage because I had accepted a job at Wrestling for One Run out here. I drove straight through. I stopped in St. Cloud for about two hours and slept, and I missed the first session uh, because I was driving. Year 11 was the 2009 that was the year I was with you wrestling 411 as that was tanking believe it or not yeah like that didn't happen like that was never going to tank 
And it was the Mark Gray, Ben Whitford, that just happened moment. Probably one of the most memorable matches in my career calling is Mark Gray was basically about to step on the on the uh, the podium as winning and beating Ben Whitford in two straight periods to win the finals. Well, they protested, put came back. Whitford got a takedown, forced a third period, and then won in the third period. And that hence the whole that just happened. Never seen anything like that before in my life. And that was also a product of the absolutely garbage rules we had in wrestling at the time. 2010, Freddie Rodriguez won his Triple Crown. Alex Deringer beat Dylan Ness. Grant Lamont of Utah made the Greco Finals in juniors as a first-year cadet because he couldn't wrestle on Sundays. That was wild. 2011, notables that stand out. I'm with USA Wrestling now. Controversy about vertical pairing ensues with Parker Von Eggety of North Carolina making the finals out of the pool system with two losses. He ended up with three. He lost in the finals, and it was with uh, Dominic Abinader, Parker Von Eggety, and Ray O'Donnell, and they all had you know, beaten each other, and there was a buy in there, and then, you know, yeah, Ricky Robertson won the weight. Other thing, yeah, the BAMF Pat Downey makes his his freestyle debut here. Wasn't a big freestyler. He had limited freestyle experience and then beats Jordan Rogers in the finals at 171. He would win a Junior World Silver the next year in Pattaya. Pattaya, Pattaya. Uh, 2012, year 14. Zane versus Zane. Rutherford versus Richards at 132. Rutherford would won the Cadet World Championship that year. It was the Cox-Snyder issue. Of course, Brett Haas had to wrestle them both in the old vertical pairing system in Greco. Jaden won freestyle. Snyder won Greco. And Willie from Flow, then then Willie was at the open mat, crashed on my couch and squatted all week. It was uh, was quite the experience. In 2013, uh, year 15, heading there through Amateur Wrestling News and the open mat, I got called in to do interviews on short notice and uh, did so, actually had Stephanie Hampton of Michigan make fun of my attire. Actually, and my wife also make fun of said attire because I was wearing orange shorts and a blue USA Wrestling polo. Uh, other things that uh, I remember about that year, uh, Elijah Oliver had the most wicked cauliflower ear. He won it for Tennessee that year. And uh, Jake Marnin actually winning the Cadet Triple Crown as a backup uh, he wasn't even the starter that year at his high school yet wins the Cadet Triple Crown. Had a chance to actually watch all three of those championships. Year 2014 was the year 16. I'm back on my own with Matt Talk Online. Colton Williams from Texas with quite possibly the sickest, like, no-arm duck under high dive back end, uh, you know, elemental P, triple Lindy freaking throw. Uh, just basically go back and find his final against Wilson Smith of North Carolina. Quite possibly one of the sickest moves I've ever seen in a uh, in, in in a wrestling match. I don't know. It might have been Greco. I don't know if it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I think it was Greco. I just remember. Uh, yeah, that was that was dirty. Uh, Johnny Blankenship and Trey Meyer decided to end the Short Time Wrestling podcast prematurely by diving through. Uh, they went Spanish announce table on me. Uh, they went off the mat into my table. Uh, driving the table into my chop, into just right in the chop, boom, and then <clears throat> yeah. Uh, at one point, uh, one of the youngsters uh, was a little annoyed, took a swing at the stuff on the table, which included uh, one ATR twenty one hundred microphone, and it goes bouncing off to the mat. And at this point, uh, Richard Immel and Mark Bader make make a point of this thing as like Jason Bright's microphones on the mat, and Richard Immel with quite possibly the best line of his career. Uh, it past, present, or future, he will never be able to match this. He goes, no short time podcast tonight, folks. One thing you remember about 2015, this is now year 17, still on my own. I prepped this tournament by interviewing the mayor of Fargo for the short time wrestling podcast is the, the class of cadet champs this year. This is, this is just a nasty class. Uh, Gable Stevenson, uh, Moshe Schwartz, Roman Bravo, young Nick Ramo, uh, Jacob Warner, I noticed Travis Whitlake Jr.'s shoe game was was quite good. His uh, Onutsuka Tigers or Onu, ah, whatever how, the, the the Tigers from Japan. So that was that was crazy good. Year eighteen, uh, the turf burned down. So uh, that's all that mattered there. And in the first half of 2017, year nineteen, the just the general journey of wrestling and this where the freestyle was first, and I got to see some some good finals. Saw some high-scoring finals in and junior freestyle. Uh, David Carr, just man-child, impressive. Carson Manville on the cadet side, things really good. Now, there are some things that go through the 
line of years that I don't quite remember. Some of them as a result of just their, I can't really remember it because it wasn't a year, or uh, there might have been a, a sudsy beverage that uh, maybe clouded my memory, my recollection. But uh, some of these are kind of related to that. So uh, here are some memorable things of note that I've experienced the past 19 years at the Junior Nationals that uh, I can't quite place a year on. But, uh, you know, the first year, this was kind of a topic that got brought up this year with with uh, Flow Arena handling the bracketing and the software versus track wrestling, is there was a year that they went to computerize the tournament for the first time, going away from the hand-drawn vertical pairing, and they blew it out. The It wouldn't work. The whole first session scrapped. Day one, session one, Cadet Greco, nothing. Nope. Done. And they just said, all right, we're doing it by hand. And made up the time and made it work. Uh, the other time was when Fargo on the North Dakota side of the line, because the Red River splits North Dakota and Minnesota. And on the Minnesota side, the establishments are known to close at 2 a.m. Uh, with last call you know, being 145. While in Fargo at the time, they were 1245, so bars closing at 1 a.m., meaning uh, there was a mass exodus from Fargo uh, to four miles across to Moorhead just for the extra hour. Well... The year Fargo changed that, nobody needed to go back across the line to Moorhead. And some of the places we were going during those years, probably better for our uh, our lifespan. Uh, There were times that uh, the year, the same night at the Bison Turf, when I beat Kendall Cross in foosball and Greg Jones in darts. I'm a pretty pretty good dart player as a whole. Um, I haven't played as much since I left Pennsylvania. We were the uh, Coors Light City League champions, the Brendy's Dart Sharks. Shout out to you. Uh, Nate Shy, et cetera, at all Monday nights, the Monday night skiles in the American darts, but, uh, the English soft tip. Yeah. I, I crushed Greg Jones. I mean, it was, it was, it, he just looks at me. He's like, dude. Yeah. So the only thing I'm good, I'm better than, uh, in terms of, uh, sporting in, uh, no darts is not a sport. It's a game, but uh, I'll take that win over Greg Jones there. Uh, maybe it was earlier that first year that Mike Newburn, the coach who was talking, uh, talk, talked me into going that first year. Uh, took the van and we went to Buck, Borrowed Bucks Roadhouse and bumped a giant truck in a country bar. Let's see. Do you have a death wish? You bumped a redneck's truck in the parking lot of a country bar. Okay. Then there was the time I asked that I'm at the turf and I wondered what the specials were that night. And they're like 250 domestics. And I was like, all right, cool. I, I was like, all right, I'll have a Rolling Rock. They had Rolling Rock on tap. And this was when Rolling Rock was brewed in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, and not owned by uh, Anheuser-Busch. Because the bottle said Latrobe in the 33 St. Louis. Yeah, it's 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 swill now. It was it actually had some character back then. So I go, oh, 250 domestics, talls, like 32 ounce, 250 domestics. Or it might have been 24 ounce. Like, uh, all right, I'll have a Rolling Rock. And the bartender or the waitress at the time goes, That's not domestic. And I looked at her and I went, Pennsylvania? And she went, oh, well, that's a premium beer. And I went, like, hell, it's a premium beer. Anyway, I just took the uh, the Mick Golden Light and the uh, Lining Kugel's Honey Vice, which was basically the things I couldn't find in Virginia or Pennsylvania that I would uh, I would partake. Uh, there was one son uh, in the not so recent past. There was the 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 flow intern who wasn't twenty one yet. So when uh, we all went to Buffalo Wild Wings to to eat, drink, be merry, and update update. They the flow guys would do what they did, and I, I you know had my computer and I was doing my th- my thing. Well, they couldn't sit in the bar area because unnamed intern wasn't twenty one yet. And then there was the flow intern who actually uh, decided to come to the tournament equipped and had said, uh, and again, I'm no, no names here, but uh, had that, uh, and they were college students. So you can give them a little bit of leeway here. Had that, uh, had that form of identification stolen the next night, the place burned down. So I still believe this, this individual should be a person of interest. Uh, There was also, again, these are more, a lot of turf stories. and, And I've said again, that, the turf really has had a big moment in my career because it's a, you know, to borrow a term from Big Brother, it's a social game. You get to know people socially and you build a rapport there. And, and one of those nights that I learned a lot about wrestling it came from sitting at the bar drinking dirty martinis with Jeff Blatnick while we played and then getting up and playing Silver Strike Bowling. It's the game that, that has the ball. It's like a centipede ball, but you're bowling. Those of you over the age of 35 will understand what I mean by when I say centipede ball. And he had told you, yeah, he's like, yeah, he trained out here. I was like, what's it like being in Fargo? He's dude, I lived out here for years training for the 80 Olympic team with Brad Rangins and Bucky Mon. So this was this was not something new to Jeff Blatnick. And, and Jeff took a lot of heat for his announcing. But Jeff was a first class dude. I mean, he was 
was just genuinely as nice as they get. He taught me a lot, just not about broadcasting. I think I had a pretty good sense of, of what I was doing there, but he just taught me about just general wrestling and knowledge and stories and and getting little things right in terms of who got credit for who in terms of coaching and you know how some of the how some of the history of wrestling was in terms of the, the politics and what it was like being an athlete that back then and I remember it was uh, my going away party at USA Wrestling uh, in, in 2012 when when Jeff passed away and and we all raised a glass you know we're at uh, I can't remember where we're at we're at it was a sports bar over there in Colorado Springs and it was like my going away party. And, you know, we're, we're, you know, and it comes on sports center sports center gave him a good tribute. And, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of things. A lot of people don't know Jeff Latnick. I didn't know him as well as I wish I would have, but in the time I spent around him, he was just a phenomenal, phenomenal person. Another time again, let's appreciate this at the turf around 2002. I want to say Ted Watulski was then working coaches education at USA wrestling and uh, he's standing there. And I think Bender might have been standing there, too. And uh, it was like, yeah, we'd like to hire. He was telling my Virginia coach, yeah, we'd like to hire him if you can finally get him to graduate. Uh, I, it took me two more years to get out and graduate. And I realized some of these stories, and I kind of have a rule, folks, when, uh, you know, if it's pertinent information and you tell me and I'm having a beer or something, it, it's off the record. Because, again, wrestling people, we have this uh, situation that we we cover people that have become friends. So it kind of creates a little bit of a of a gray area, what's on the record, what's off the record, and, and professional courtesy and ethics and things of that nature. But I've always said, if I'm having a beer, I'm off the record. And that's that's kind of one of these things I've always had, I've adhered to, because, you know, you got to set at least some type of line so you know when, when you can talk and when you can't. And it's one of those things that I've always kind of, you know, just done that, because, hey, I'm, if, I'm, if I'm kicking back relaxing, you don't have to worry about me, you know, pulling out my phone and tweeting it or writing it on, on the internet. So uh, this story on the other hand is, is one that it, it gets better with age, much like the subject. So I'm at the, I don't know, I'm at the turf and Bucky Mon was still the coach at North Dakota state. And he's sitting there. His brother, Jack was then the coach at Northern Colorado. His, I mean, actually his son, Jack, not his brother, not his brother, uh, his son. I did meet his brother this year in, uh, in Stillwater. Didn't realize it was him. It's like, no, I'm not Bucky. I'm like, oh, yeah, wow. So anyway, Jack is sitting there. He was a coach at Northern Colorado. And his other son, Brett, was an assistant at North Dakota State. And I'm like, and his wife is sitting there and his, his some family. And it was, you know, they're at a table. And, and Bucky's like the mayor of Fargo. Like the unoffic- He probably still is the unofficial mayor of Fargo. I'm like, coach, what are you drinking? He goes, grain belt premium. That'll put hair on your balls. I about spit out my beer. I was just like, are you I mean, this is in front of his wife. I'm like, okay. Um I don't know about the the end result, but let's just say uh, the primo. Okay, it's got a it's got a distinct taste to it, and uh, premium light is just freaking awful. Um, there, there, I kind of alluded to it in the beginning that uh, how I missed the first bout of the Cormier Morrison wrestle off. Let's just say it's never a good time when you're coming back into the dorm at six a.m. For a uh, 10 a.m. session now, and I want to preface this too. I'm 37, almost 38 years old. These things are happening when I'm still a college student. Uh, you know, I still did got my work done, took care of that with the with that exception. Um, okay, there were a few more exceptions than that until I was gainfully employed from 2005 on. I never missed a session, missed a session. You know, now it's just like yeah, I, I took care of those things. So, uh, yeah, let's just say it ended up. With uh, Flip Cup and North Dakota State Cheerleaders House and uh, me and my roommate, actually my college roommate at the time. And no, it's not identifiable because I had 27 roommates in college. So uh, we just ended up coming back <laughs> at like 6 a.m. I slept in late. Uh, basically blew the whole wrestle off. Then came back and broadcast the next two. Cormier won that. Uh, karaoke at Chumley's, which was one of the haunts that we used to go over into Moorhead in. So uh, at one point I remember sitting up there paying and it was like, were we doing karaoke? He's like, yeah, we, we're done. I was like, I paid 10 bucks for one song. Okay. I get up there and, you know, belt out chocolate salty balls. And uh, I come off the, the stage, and it was on a stage. Go, I was, like, performing. And uh, Brian Keck is standing there just belly laughing with Nick Simmons. They can't keep each other up. I was like, dude, I used to, I used to close out nights like that. So, uh, you know, again, most of these social stories – um, there was midget wrestling one night at Coaches, which was another bar in Moorhead, and it was like, and I don't, I don't, and I don't mean like the age group, the midgets. I mean it was on the sign. It's probably not even politically correct to say it. Uh, so, uh, little people wrestling, yeah, this was a thing. There was a ring in there, uh, yeah. There was also a story that I even that even hit the Reddit uh, from Fargo about the tournament about a coach from uh, a state 
that may or may not have been first into the union eating glass, like chewing it up, actually happened, witnessed it. Crazy. Um, not to just say that uh, flow interns are the only one that, that escaped my eye. Or there was the USA Wrestling intern one year who thought it was a good idea to go up to his high school coach at a Perkins at four in the morning. Usually not a good combination when people are saying, oh, there's my high school coach and it's four in the morning. Yeah, uh, there's also the unnamed USA Wrestling intern uh, showing up late for sessions because of their choice of footwear. As you've heard, many of these stories already involve the turf. There was the time I actually wrote a story on the turf. I actually wrote a story about resident life, and then uh, I actually went went to went to Hooters because at the time it was a uh, a jam packed destination for uh, athletes and and especially a referee named Hester. I don't know. He he tends to go to those anyway. Uh, there was there were you know so I interviewed the 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 general managers and the wait staff at a couple different places on how they would brace for it, and then of course the turf. I wrote a uh, you know. Basically, what I'm doing now as I'm as I'm vocalizing all these type of stories to you, yeah, I did a story on the turf for Intermat, and I remember Gary Abbott when I said something. He's like, "You wrote a story on a bar." I'm like, "Yes, I did. I could probably write a lot more." You've kind of gotten just a, just the tip of the iceberg here. Uh, the time uh, Willie's first year at Flow, and uh, we he ends up getting into town earlier. And this is I learned some of the Willieisms. Uh, some of them I'm not going to tell you because uh, if you've ever spent any time. In a domicile with Willie, you, you'll get it real quick. And uh, yeah, Willie and I go back. We go back, uh, you know, over a decade. And regardless of where where we've been working, it's just been it's been hilarity. But there was the time we sit down. Let's get lunch at B Dubs. Like we're the only two from our respective outfits in town yet. And it took him an hour and a half to order lunch. And I don't even know what it was. It ended up being like a snack size of wings or, or a half dozen wings or something like that. It was like you just waited an hour and a half. To do this, I mean, it went all through happy hour, and uh, when we finally got the bill, like happy hour wasn't over anymore. Anyway, and finally, probably one of the one things that that makes me feel really good, and of course, this is my show, so there's a little little selfie humble brag here, is walking into an establishment, and I've gotten to know a lot of referees, and you know what? These referees have taught me a lot about wrestling in terms of what to look for and what to call. So, uh, and in years, I would sit there. Doing the broadcast, I think I did the broadcast from like 2002 to 2013, uh, whenever, uh, probably 2012, whenever uh, I left USA Wrestling and then Flo picked up the contract, you know, I was on the call. I mean, there's there's times Alex Deringer talks about his favorite call, and it was it was one of mine uh, against Zach Skates, and and that was that was that was just so much fun. But it's the referees that I get to I've have bonded with over the years and be like they become friends, and a lot of them are freestyle officials and they're folk style coaches. But they still spend time doing this. And I walk in and they do the whole like, Jason Bryant. They clap like that. And I'm just like, okay, dude, really? Really? Okay, that is kind of cool. Uh, because um, if there's one thing that's grown over the years, it's my ego. No, anyway, I, that's just, I want to say that that was a few stories. And there's so many different ways I could I could go down the line. And as, as I sit here and I look at the outline that I put together, this was initially going to be for bonus points. And I shared it with Richard Emily. He's like, dude, this can be like a two-hour show. And I'm sitting there. I was just talking to you about this stuff on my own without any interaction. And I'm just going down like, okay, here are the things I remember. And uh, you get this. So, you know, to some people, this is going to be interesting. To some people, uh, they're like, okay, you just told us a bunch of bar stories. Well, you know what? I say again, the part about this sport that makes it so special is the relationships that you've built. And you know what? Sometimes... There, there does involve a, a dive bar and, and some beers and some flip cup and, you know, being in your 20s, you know, I'm, I'm 37 years old. I'm married with two kids. I'm not, I'm not looking to go to house parties after last call. That just doesn't happen anymore, right? No, it doesn't. So it's, it really is the relationship. And a lot of these center around a pattern, a family. You see people every year you do, you, you, you come you convene and like sitting outside of of the dorm with uh, an official or two that may or may not be breaking the rules about smoking a cigar at uh, at 12 o'clock at night. You know, I mean, you know, sitting there having a going up and getting my growler filled up by Eric Sanders at his place every year. You know, he's got a Hefeweizen that's that's phenomenal. I'm, I'm kind of like I said, I'm into and in being a beer snob a little bit. 
Uh, unfortunately, missed his wedding, but uh, he did give me the 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 draft class party favor, and in return, he will get a Matt Talk online draft class. But it's th- these relationships, and I've said this for years. There is no better place in the world for the sport of wrestling than seven or eight days in July in Fargo, North Dakota. Now, granted, it's been it's been so hot some years that you slide off the toilet seat at two in the morning, and that yeah, that's a little that's some bad imagery there. But it's it's so hot you, you don't need a sauna there. Cause and then sometimes it's like, wow, it's beautiful. We got there this year. It was phenomenally chill. I mean, just cool, nice. I mean, long sleeve weather if you wanted to. And then there's nights you sit there and the Newman indoor state and Newman, Newman outdoor stadium has the Red Hawks playing the, 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 the independent league team. There's a team here, the St. Paul saints. Well, there's the Fargo Moorhead Red Hawks that play across the street where you, where you sit up on the top of your Bronco and, and listen to Willie Nelson play a concert or see baseball or, you sit there and you meet the new coaches at Concordia or Minnesota State, Moorhead, or or the the new the, the coaches from Minot State who come down and help run the volunteer pool like you know, like Forty and and McGee and and you know all those crew that you meet over the years. There's things that are going to always stay off the record because the stories you get to tell with one another each time you come back be like, dude, you remember that time we went down to Empire? Or dude, do you remember that time that guy got kicked out of the turf? Or, dude, you remember that time that guy played Rock Lobster 127 times on the jukebox? Actually, I'm not going to keep that one a secret. That was freaking sunny close. He had the Touch Tunes app and played Rock Lobster like every single day on a loop. He must have spent 100 bucks that week just playing doom, de doom, de 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 doom, Rock Lobster. And in case you don't know what Rock Lobster is, it's by the B-52s. So, that being said... Things that come out of this year as I wrap up this particular episode, episode 345 of the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, as I am looking at the clock approximately 10.30 p.m. because the, the glory of podcasting is, folks, I started this around 3.20 in the afternoon. And then our nanny left, and I watched the kids. I had to put them to bed because, again, my wife is out of town. And being a father, is it's hard work. And I'm not looking for any sympathy here because uh, there are better fathers, I think. I think I do the best job that I can for my kids. And uh, my wife is is just a rock star. So it takes me a little longer to get the kids to bed, two of them, uh, and, and try to try to try to <laughs> I'm trying to bargain with a five year old about whether she wants a shower or a bath or a fast bath or, you know, which flavor of toothpaste she wants to use or, you know. I'm not as good as my wife is at that yet, but uh, hence there was a delay. And I, you know, when I started at two at three thirty, and I look and I took a pause, probably about forty minutes into the show. Again, you you wouldn't have noticed it, but man, there's just some there's something about this. This that's why it's that's why I'm not leaving wrestling. Never never thought about leaving. I get asked all the time. Well, why why are you looking to branch out? No, no, no. Um, I don't want to even use the word content. I'm not content with the the big fish small pond type of scenario. I am not content. I enjoy it. I thrive on this type of thing cuz it's what's great about wrestling. You know, uh Alex Steen had said something to me while we were having lunch. He's he's with the Open Mat and it's like, you know, he's doing a great job. He's jumping in. He's not a journalist by trade, but he's he's working it. He's developing angles. He's going and getting sources. He's He's making sure that some facts are right before he writes a story. You know, he's doing a good job. And he goes, it's weird how you can go from not being a journalist to now, you know, being a journalist or attempting to be a journalist and be relevant. I mean, almost immediately. It's it, it's some in some ways it's a flaw in our sport. And in some ways it's a benefit because it, it's allowed somebody like me. It's allowed people like Martin Floriani. It's it's people like the open mat and five point move. And they're, you know, initially Intermat, which was, you know, when Intermat was run by just, you know, Tom Owens, a guy out of Iowa that liked wrestling, an Iowa State alum, or Joe LaRue, a, a wrestling fan in North Carolina. These things are the the access to the entry points for media and wrestling still are very good. So, uh, you know, I'm not content. I'm happy. And I'm happy telling these stories. And I'm happy meeting people. And I'm happy to rock the shirt of anyone that anybody gives me right now. I'm, as I'm said, I'm still wearing the, uh, the, the, the shirt from that other place talking about Mike Denny. Wrestling's a fantastic sport. Fargo is just kind of like what brought it all together for me. 
Because if I don't go that first year, I don't know if I go that second year. And I don't know if I keep going. And it never becomes a part of my schedule. It never becomes part of my routine. It doesn't become a Christmas in July. And it's a grind, especially when I worked at USA Wrestling. When working with, with Gary and Craig Sesker, we, we, we worked hard. And we worked hard with various degrees of technology that evolved. One year, I put up a thousand videos by myself. This was even before we had we had what Adam Fenn had built with Wrestling Video Solutions that would automatically upload. You know, the next year I did nine thousand. I was sitting in my dorm room cutting up video on computer, 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 like ding, ding. Technology has changed everything. And you keep working hard, but it doesn't change the fact that when you go to Fargo and you make this an annual visit, and I I encourage those of you out there who have the opportunity to give back to the sport of wrestling and get into freestyle coaching, get into officiating, get on your local coaching staff, your state coaching staff, find a way to get involved and be there because if there's no better way to get connected to people in this sport Then by going to a place that all you're going to talk about for eight straight days is wrestling. You can sit down and and hang out with Billy Bob from the the, the, uh, state down south. I mean, that's I'm probably stereotyping here, but uh, let's let's just use let's let's use a uh, let's use a coach from Georgia. You can hang out with Jeff Reagan, a coach from Georgia who wrestled D1 as an All-American Oklahoma State. And then you can sit down and talk to Brandon Paulson, Olympic silver medalist who does a, a club. Or you can sit and talk to Nathan Coburn, the executive director of VAWA, who was, you know, never started at Old Dominion. Or you can sit there and talk with Kendall Cross or Greg Jones or Alan Freed or, you know, the late Jeff Blatnick. Well, you can't do that now, but I'm saying these are all experiences that go into building that relationship and what makes wrestling great. I'm off tangent here. I'm off script. I don't know. I just I just want to get the point across, and I've probably beaten it over the head. I love this sport. I love the people in it. As flawed as we may be and as dysfunctional as a family as we may be, we're still a family, folks. And we love this sport. And it's events like this that I circle every year, block it off. And while I wasn't there the whole time this year, still sitting there watching each and every moment I can get. And my kids take a, take a lot of precedence there because uh, they do come first. But that's just what the sport is to me. So. I appreciate you listening to this rant among rants or well, more or less a, a soliloquy, if you will, about the sport of wrestling and what this town, this tournament, the people that are in it, the people that run it mean and what they meant to a 19-year-old who was wet behind the ears trying to break into the media and, and having wrestling take a hold of my life the way it has. So for the team members and the patrons out there who contribute to this network and this program specifically each and every month through our Patreon program at patreon.com slash Online or quickly mattalkonline.com slash join the team. Thank you. I know you don't do it for the gear. I don't know. You, I know you don't do it for the draft glass or the shirt or the almanac or anything of those sorts, but you do it because you love wrestling and you feel that there's a value here. And if you feel there's a value in the product, that I provide for you, whether it be the Hall of Fame Legends show or this show, the Short Time Wrestling Podcast, or any of the other things that I do, like the college wrestling standings. I'm the only one in the country that does that. You feel it's worth your while, I would ask you to join the team at matttalkonline.com slash join the team. Dollar a month, folks. Dollar a month, five bucks, ten bucks, whatever you want. It's basically like uh, some night at the turf. You know, it's five dollar you call it. Well, it's one dollar you call it. Maybe it's twenty dollar you call it. Maybe it's five dollar you call it. You call your level of support at matttalkonline.com slash join the team. Like, thank you for spending your time with me and the last 19 years in Fargo, North Dakota, because you've always got time for short time.
This show is part of the Matt Talk Podcast Network. For more wrestling podcasts, head over to matttalkonline.com.